Welcome everyone to today's webinar. We will get started at about 10.02 Eastern Time, so please stand by. Again, welcome to those joining our webinar today. We will get started in about two minutes, so just please stand by. We're waiting for more people to join. Okay, welcome everyone to today's webinar on FDA guidance for ABPM. We have two presenters today, Dr. Robert Kleiman, Chief Medical Officer at ERT, and Tricia Castellano, Senior Director of Product Management, also at ERT. Dr. Kleiman will first speak to the current regulatory guidance on BP assessment of new drugs, and then Tricia will take it away and speak to best practices for implementing ABPM in your upcoming trials. Dr. Kleiman? Please go ahead. Hi, folks. This is Bob Kleiman. As you've just heard, I'm the Chief Medical Officer for ERT, and I'm a cardiologist by background, so hypertension and hypertensive effects on patients' cardiac function is something that's very important in cardiology. And today I'm going to talk about the regulatory landscape around assessing the blood pressure effects of a new drug. As some background, first, I want to let people know you should be aware that this isn't really a sudden regulatory change that we're seeing. The FDA has been interested in this for probably about a decade. There was a public think tank sponsored by the FDA and Cardiac Safety Research Consortium back in 2002 with a title, During Clinical Development, Is There a Need for More Intensive Systematic Blood Pressure Evaluation, and How Should This Be Considered? Now, at the time, there weren't any blanket requirements for intense blood pressure monitoring in new trials, and there still are informal requirements, but to be perfectly honest, for the past five or six years, the FDA has been requesting intense blood pressure data, and usually ambulatory blood pressure monitoring data, for new drugs in certain classes or that have a specific profile in their preclinical or very early clinical trials. So why is blood pressure important? I, I think by now everyone knows that hypertension is associated with an increased risk of cardiovascular events such as myocardial infarction and particularly stroke. And we know this from a huge number of epidemiologic studies, such as the Framingham study, for which I have some data here. What's important to realize is it is not just that hypertension itself is a risk factor for CV events. In fact, it turns out that within a normotensive range, every millimeter of mercury increase in blood pressure population, excuse me, in blood pressure for a population means there will be an increased risk of cardiac events in the, that population, even within the normotensive range. Now, drugs can do many different things to blood pressure. They can produce large effects that may be very easy to detect and produce a lot of symptoms or organ damage, or they can produce small effects that may actually be quite difficult to tell. And they may move a patient who has borderline hypertension or normal blood pressure into the hypertensive range. And the only way to find this out is really to collect the data in clinical trials and see 
what the blood pressure effect is. And then there's, as always, a risk-benefit analysis. You have a drug to treat a very serious illness with no effective therapies. A blood pressure effect is much less of a concern than if you're treating a young population with a not terribly serious illness for which there are other treatments available. It will all go into the weighing the risks and the balances. There are a lot of drugs that are on the market that we know increase blood pressure. Some classes in which there's a general effect include corticosteroids, non-steroidals, erythropoietin, and tyrosine kinase inhibitors and VEGF inhibitors, classes in which there are a lot of drugs, some of which produce very large changes in blood pressure. And some of the common drugs which we know increase, increase blood pressure are propion, the antidepressant, Celebrex, Tylenol, Motrin, and Naproxen, which happens to be what I take when I have aches and pains. So these drugs are out there, and many of them have not had very precise assessments of the exact magnitude of their blood pressure. Now, through this talk, I'll, I'll make some comparisons to QT assessment, just because that's the big cardiac safety issue we've been dealing with for the past 15 years. But unlike QT prolongation, which when we're talking about drug-induced increases in QTC, we're talking about a very limited number of mechanisms. When we talk about drug-related effects on blood pressure, there are many very different physiologic mechanisms that may be responsible, ranging from salt and water retention to vasoconstriction, effects on prostaglandins, effects on the renin-angiotensin system, block of antihypertensive medications or a combination of effects. Because of that, we, we have to think about this a little more broadly than we do about QT prolongation, where we're talking about a very limited set of mechanisms. So in drug development, obviously, you always want to start with your preclinical assessments to see if there's any hint. And you can do receptor binding assays for the appropriate culprits to see if there's any effect there. You can do studies of instrumented anesthetized animals or in unanesthetized large animals. The issue is, of course, just as in almost every other area, the sensitivity and specificity of the preclinical assessments isn't really clear. And there are false positives and false negatives based on preclinical assessments. So where do we currently stand? Well. In May of last year, the FDA introduced a draft guidance on blood pressure monitoring titled Assessment of Pressor Effects of Drugs Guidance for Industry. And it's still in draft format. I don't know if it'll ever be finalized or not. But I think it's important to point out this doesn't represent a sea change in regulatory thinking. It's just the FDA trying to be helpful and document what are the things that they take into account when they think about does a new drug require more blood pressure assessment we might normally do? The guidance speaks a little bit about the background. And as we've said, even a two to three millimeter mercury increase in blood pressure over a prolonged period of time increases the rates of stroke, heart attack, and death. And an interesting and important point is that the risk differs based on your cardiovascular risk factors and your general medical profile. Same blood pressure increase for the same duration and time produces a much lower risk of stroke, heart attack, death in patients who have very low cardiovascular risk, as opposed to patients who have pre-existing cardiovascular risk factors, hypertension, hyperlipidemia, cigarette smoking, diabetes, they already have some cardiovascular and vascular disease, whether it's documented yet or not, and their risk is much higher than a, a younger, healthier population. And that will come into the FDA's thinking as well. The guidance comments about the timing in which drug-induced 
increases in blood pressure are likely to be important. And we know from epidemiologic studies that within about six to 12 months, an increase in blood pressure translates into an increase in cardiovascular events. They also comment that there are some drugs that are known to increase blood pressure that are associated with severe adverse cardiovascular effects. Of course, it hasn't been proven that the blood pressure effect is what causally is responsible for the increased risk, the increased rate of cardiovascular events. All of the drugs that they mentioned have mechanisms of action that, even if they didn't increase blood pressure, would increase cardiovascular events. So though it's not proven, it seems reasonable to expect that chronic use drugs that increase blood pressure will increase cardiovascular risk. And they quote the Precision ABPM trial, which showed blood pressure increases and increased cardiovascular event rates for several drugs. Again, it's not proof, but it seems very reasonable. The guidance makes some recommendations. First, for drugs intended for short-term use, defined as less than 12 weeks, it's really only large blood pressure increases that are of concern. And these can probably be detected with standard, though accurate, office blood pressure measurements with a standard Sphygmo manometer. And when you're collecting this, of course, accuracy is important. They recommend triplicate blood pressure measurements of sitting blood pressure in all subjects at baseline, at several visits during dosing, and including at the end of the interdosing interval trough, as well as at peak concentration. And of course, you need a pre-dose assessment to see if there's been an increase. In contrast, for drugs intended for chronic use, that is longer than 12 weeks, it seems that very likely but difficult to prove that even a small sustained increase in blood pressure of two to three millimeters of mercury over a population is going to translate to an increased rate of cardiovascular events. And the FDA recommends that for this drug use uh, scenario, drug for chronic use, ABPM should be used for the blood pressure assessments. It allows the assessment of blood pressure effects over 24 hours not just at a single point in time when the patient is in the clinic. And it allows for more precise measurements than we get with standard office visit measurements. The devices are automatic. They don't require, other than putting the device on and taking it off, any interactions by medical personnel or the patient to collect the measurements. And they eliminate investigator bias, problems with transcription of data onto a paper form or into a C, an ECRF, and they help eliminate concerns about either white coat hypertension or mask hypertension. An important point that the FDA stressed several times, the blood pressure assessments need to be performed in the target patient population, not just in healthy volunteers. Back to that in a bit. Some design considerations. First, it's generally desirable to have a placebo group as the control, but I'll come back to why that may have some disadvantages. Again, they recommend using ABPM, and you want to collect the data at steady state. And steady state means not just the pharmacokinetic steady state for parents and metabolites, but actually the blood pressure steady state, the, the steady state for the pharmacodynamic effects which may not parallel the PK. They recommend that the endpoint should be the integrated mean area under the curve of the blood pressure throughout the day, rather than comparing each of the 50 or 100 blood pressure measurements to a baseline day. And if you detect no significant blood pressure effect in early patient studies, then you just need routine cuff clinic measurements later on. However, if you do detect or can't exclude a significant blood pressure effect in the overall patient population, then you need additional information about the effect in particularly high-risk groups, those with hypertension, paired renal status, known cardiovascular disease or vascular disease. 
Now, after the release of the guidance, uh, about a half year passed, and then in February of this year, the FDA and the Cardiac Safety Research Consortium held an open forum think tank to discuss the guidance. And the purpose was really to elicit external opinions for the benefit of the FDA, not to educate us. But nevertheless, from their presentations, their questions and their answers to some questions, we've learned some important things about their thinking. First, their threshold of concern is lower than we expected. At the moment, they've stated that it's a two millimeter increase in mean 24 hour systolic blood pressure or a one millimeter increase in mean 24 hour diastolic blood pressure. That's pretty small effect that you really need ambulatory blood pressure measurement to detect. We talked a little bit about whether or not a placebo group is needed. I'll show you a little bit of data on that. The general consensus from both the FDA and the audience was that ambulatory blood pressure measurement assessments in patients are somewhat cumbersome and uncomfortable, and compliance isn't great. And therefore, it's difficult to get patients to agree to more than two or perhaps three ambulatory blood pressure measurement sessions. After two or three sessions, the compliance really tends to drop off. So the general recommendation is collect a baseline assessment and then do a second assessment at six to 12 weeks when you know you're at steady state for PK and as well as for any blood pressure response. Do a third one later on, great, or a third one in between, but these are the two that are probably most important for excluding a blood pressure effective concern. The FDA showed some data suggesting that you could detect small blood pressure effects in a, quote, reasonably small study, although the study that they showed the data on had 444 patients in a sub-study, and I don't know, I don't consider that to be terribly small. All of the ambulatory blood pressure measurement trials that we've recently done have much smaller patient sets. Regarding the need for a placebo, the guidance states that it's generally desirable to include a placebo group, but the FDA presented data about that that's quite interesting. And they based that on their own internal data set, which is composed of about 20 odd ABPM studies. About half of them have a placebo arm. Some of them are for antihypertensives demonstrating efficacy, but some of them are for safety of non-cardiovascular drugs. And using the database, they did some modeling. The first thing they presented was that to exclude a four millimeter blood pressure effect, if you don't have a placebo arm, you need far fewer subjects than if you do have a placebo arm. And it's not a, a, a doubling of the number, it's increasing the number of subjects by three to fourfold. That's a large increase in the number of subjects that you need. However, I think there's a great risk in not having a placebo group in this type of trial when we're measuring something that's highly variable, even without any drug effects. And where having a small sample size really runs the risk of having very wide confidence intervals around your point estimates of blood pressure effect and therefore a great risk of false positives. They also talked about how you determine if the blood pressure assessments that a pa an individual patient has collected are adequate. Now there are several sets of criteria that are in the literature. One is, and probably the most common, is the European Society of Hypertension set of criteria. They define a valid 24-hour ABPM session as one in which 70% of the expected measurements are, are valid, at least 20 during the day and seven at night, measurements every 30 minutes, and at least two valid daytime and one valid nighttime per hour. There are also some criteria about how many consecutive hours might be missing data. And I think these are pretty strict because you need to have strict criteria when in clinical practice, you're using ABPM to either determine if a patient is hypertensive or to monitor their response to their antihypertensive therapy. In contrast, in a clinical trial, we're not so much worried about individual subjects and outliers. We're more concerned about the effect over the total group. 
And if there's missing data on individual patients' ABPM recordings, it's likely to be relatively normally distributed across the 24 hours, maybe with some variation for day-night time. So the FDA did, again, modeling to see how much missing data affected the power to detect uh, or exclude a small blood pressure effect. And the data suggests that up to 50% missing data on a single individual session is probably fine. They also took a look at how many inflations per hour you need to be able to exclude a four millimeter of mercury effect. And it turns out that the sweet spot is probably about two an hour. And that one, even one per hour, particularly at night, might be effective. And going to three or four really doesn't add much power. And having more inflations affects compliance. They also talked a little bit about concentration blood pressure effect modeling, which is quite complex. As everyone I'm sure knows, we use this quite a bit in QT assessments. They stressed that first for blood pressure, you really need to make sure you're at steady state for both PK and blood pressure effects because the two may be very temporally dissociated. There are drugs that produce their effect with the first dose, but drugs with a different mechanism such as salt and water retention, they may not produce their peak effect for weeks. So it's generally recommended, again, you make sure you're doing it late enough after the first dose. And in terms of is it peak plasma concentration or some other assessment that's most important, it may turn out to be AUC or trough values that are key rather than, as for QT, just CMAX. They also said several times the role of ABPM in healthy volunteer studies is unclear, might be useful, but it's probably not sufficient. So they presented this slide about design considerations for efficient ABPM studies. As we've, we've discussed all of these, 24-hour average blood pressure as the endpoint. Placebo may not be necessary. The threshold to exclude is we've mentioned, but may be different for different target populations. Again, if you're treating young adults for one or two years, there may be a more latitude. They talked about, and again, at least two measurements per hour, and you probably only need 50% of expected measurements per individual. Both of these increase the compliance, which make your data better. So a, a, a summary, it, this is largely focused on drugs for chronic use. You only need a small study, but again, this comes down to power and power to exclude is all about precision, so you need really high quality data. Third method is ABPM. Requirement looks to be a, a ex excluding a blood pressure effect of two millimeters of mercury systolic. That may still be open to further revision, we don't know. The FDA said that they plan to establish a blood pressure review team similar to the IRT for QT data to help give advice to the review divisions or to someone sending them a proposal for comments. And they've tried to make it clear they don't want to repeat the, quote, QT mistake, whatever exactly that is, as opposed to our general consensus, and we'll see if they are able to do that or not. Again, to reiterate the, some key points, you need to do this in a target population, not just healthy volunteers. There's some talk about using home blood pressure or precise clinic blood pressure assessments, so-called sprint methodology. I think those will increase in use, but not clear what the regulatory value is yet. And I specifically asked the FDA members, first, are you gonna use this data for decisions about approval or complete responses? Do the clients have to, who are developing new drugs have to worry that they detect a really small blood pressure effect that that's going to enter into their approval decisions. And the FDA said no. This is really intended so that when a drug is approved, we can properly label it so that a prescribing physician will know they have to be extra careful and do additional blood pressure 
assessments on a patient started on one of these drugs, particularly if they're already hypertensive, have many risk factors. Whether this is true always comes down to the time of review and the reviewing division. So I, I'm pleased that the FDA said this. I hope the review divisions will follow it. I also specifically asked them, if you did demonstrate a small blood pressure effect, are you going to ask the sponsor for a large cardiovascular outcome trial? And my concern, of course, was that cardiovascular outcome trials cost half a billion to a billion dollars, and they would destroy drug development if they asked for that. And I was very reassured. They said, no, we already know that long-term blood pressure increases are bad. You don't have to show that again for each drug. And that's reassuring, and I, again, hope that the review divisions will stick to that. Because if they do, what the FDA outlined in the guidance and in meeting in, May of the, uh, in February of this year really doesn't represent a large change from what they've been doing drug by drug for the past five years. So I'm hopeful that the FDA's actions are helpful to all of us in understanding what they're looking for and what they don't re request. They're not asking for a huge thorough blood pressure trial for every new drug coming out there. So I'm going to stop here, and I'm going to turn the floor over to Tricia Castellano, who's going to talk more about how to collect blood pressure, and particularly ambulatory blood pressure measurements in your clinical trials. Thanks, Bob. Hi, everyone. I'm Tricia Castellano. and I'm Senior Product Manager at ERT. And as Bob said, we've discussed the why and when, and now I'm going to cover a little bit about what we've learned to help reinforce best practices and success um, in collecting ABPM in your trial. So ambulatory blood pressure monitoring, or we call it ABPM for short, is a type of blood pressure monitoring. And it was built um, specifically to look at uh, day versus night or long terms of monitoring. And it was traditionally used to, uh, by hypertensive experts to understand what was going on with their patient's blood pressure and if their drug was effective. Um, and so day and night calculations tend to be a big part of the traditional way that, that blood pressure was collected in ABPM. Um, today, those devices haven't changed. We're still using specialized devices that consist of a blood pressure cuff. It's usually put on the upper arm. It's put on the upper arm. It's common to use the non-dominant arm so that patients aren't impacted by a lot of activity, trying to brush their teeth and such. And it's connected to rubber tubing. Um, it connects to a device with an internal pump and the pump inflates. And that's what causes the cuff to, to inflate and then deflate. And that records blood pressure and pulse. The key to this device, why it's specialized, is it's programmed to auto-inflate at predetermined intervals. So there's no need to manually trigger an inflation. And each inflation for a typical size arm and a standard size cuff takes usually less than a minute. But ABPM is not that common in clinical trial, trials. Traditionally, we only saw it, we saw it infrequently, not like ECG or QT collection. And so there's a lot of clinicians or site personnel that are not experienced with ABPM. They're, they're not familiar with it. And it's likely that even your own study teams may not be as familiar uh, with ABPM as they are with the concerns about TQT. Traditionally, we only saw ABPM in large phase studies, sometimes in phase two, but that's really changing. We see more and more interest in phase two and even into phase three, and um, phase early phase, first time in man. But our experience has taught us that each of these studies, even if they're all in the same phase, have different nuances. Each patient population might be a little different, each study is different, and the needs or how the site is performing their complexities, their day is a little different. So it's important to kind of use lessons learned to help figure out how to navigate and plan for those complexities so that you aren't impacted by loss of data and difficulty with patient compliance. So there are mechanisms that we train people how to collect blood pressure. Instructions and training is critical. So you're, in a lot of my discussion, I'm going to focus on the site and the patient. Um, and with the site, it's important to teach them how to properly fit and apply the cuff, about how to drape the tube, how to position the pouch, 
there's software that interacts with the device, and so they need to understand how you pair the device to tell the device who the file belongs to, its identification, what is the workflow that they're going to go through, how do they upload the data, how do they review that data, and then transferring data to the back end. What are all those steps? And then we always suggest that you include a site qualification step. Practice is important, but actually get some proof that your site personnel have used the device and have used it in the way that your study was programmed. Um, you know, get that data and collect it and send it to the back end so you can see what does that look like so you can mitigate any issues early on. And then you want to provide patient instruction cards if the patient's going, particularly if the patient's going home to wear the device for any period. Um, now, we also encourage that site personnel wear the device. They're not always compliant, but this is going to make a big difference in your study. Even with sleep, not just a few hours, if your study is collecting 24 hours, have your, the person that's going to work with the patient actually wear it while they're sleeping and through the whole cycle because they're going to be more sensitive, more understanding about what that experience is like and help the patient work through uh, any of the tolerance issues. Uh, and we think it's important also to have the personnel practice with the patient so the patient feels enabled and comfortable and competent uh, in, in identifying any issues or even reconciling any, any of the cuff placements themselves. For the patient, we always say, be still during inflation deflation. You can't sit and rest with your feet flat necessarily like you do with clinic BP, right? This is ambulatory. So we at least advise the patient Stand still, don't move, don't move your wrists, don't move your fingers. Don't take the cup off, don't shower. We want the patient often to, to follow normal daily activities so you get an insight to their true blood pressure. But your, your site personnel want, needs to plan around activities that make sense. If your patient's planning on an exercise class, then schedule around those activities that might cause more artifact. Data quality, so as Bob was mentioning, Compliance is an issue with ABPM. It has always been an issue, particularly with certain populations. I'm not going to talk about that in a minute. Um, but there's no such thing as a perfect ABPM. It is so rare to ever get an ABPM where there's not some missing values and some, um, or some artifact going on. And that makes sense because think about it. You're wearing this cuff for a long period of time. Typically, you're collecting 40 or more inflations over 24 hours, and we do see some studies go beyond 24 hours, up to even 56, and now with the early phase studies, we're seeing questions about five and six days of monitoring. We see consistently that the longer the monitoring period, the more the compliance declines, so that's something you want to plan for. Um, when you wear this, it's uncomfortable, and some patients just can't tolerate it. They'll, they'll do it once, and they'll say, I'm never going to wear that again. Um, and it's, it's particularly difficult when sleeping with the device. That's where we see some of the, the most complaints. And it may not just be the patient themselves. They may get used to the inflations. It may be their spouse or their partner that's complaining because of the noise the pump's making, making both of them restless. So it's really important to prep the patient for what to expect, and coaching leads to better compliance. So why do you lose data? Well, the most common things that we see that cause missed data or missed periods of time are movement, movement artifact. Um, sometimes the patients take the cuff off, often for small periods, sometimes even though for several hours, and we especially see that at night. Um, sometimes the cuff, depending on the cuff that you're using, will shift. We've seen it shift down to the elbow, and so the inflations can't be collected. Uh, and then key toes is another common reason. Again, often we see that at night, and so it's important to, to, to prep the, the, the coordinator and, and the patient about how to, how to handle the um, draping of the tube. You need to define the inflation plan. So there's all kinds of options in setting how often is it going to inflate and when it's going to inflate. And the first step is to define, am I going to have my patient wear this while they're sleeping? And if I'm going to do look at day versus night, what do I consider those hours to be across the study? When are patients typically going to get up in the morning and when are they typically going to get, go to bed? Um, how many inflations per hour are you going to have them the same? Bob talked a lot about what the standard might be. We see lots of studies do uh, more inflations in the day and less at night because that helps to, to reduce the disturbance on sleep. But some studies want to collect the same inflations 
um, schedule across the entire monitoring period. How long are you going to monitor? Are you going to go beyond 24 hours? And then what other nuances do you want to pay attention to? Are you trying to sync inflations and scheduling to when patients taking dose? Now, we're seeing more first-time in man um, studies coming in, and some of those protocols are written treating blood pressure inflations exactly like ECG collection, ECG extractions. So there, there seems to be people who are thinking about them that are the same as a continuous telemetry or halter monitoring. But there, it's really different, as Bob was speaking to. You're getting different numbers of availability of data. And so you also want to think about when am I doing that monitoring? You see some phase ones intentionally having the telemetry monitoring going on at the same time as the ADPM. But think about that. You're wearing cuffs likely on your non-dominant arm, which may be your left arm, and you may actually be impacting V6 and V5 while you're wearing that, that telemetry um, cable. So it's important to kind of look at when are critical times of data that I need if I'm monitoring two different endpoints at the same time, and how do I make sure they don't interfere with one another? So quality criteria. Some studies have really sick patients, and they just want to get whatever data they can because they know the patients are going to struggle. But most studies have an amount of data they're expecting to collect so they understand what's going on with their drug and that they know there's a certain amount of data that the regulators want to see. So you need to think about, all right, if I have a certain amount of data that I need to collect at certain periods, how am I defining that? is what's practical for my patient population in my, in my study? Are some periods more critical than others? The kind of typical criteria that we can program is things like how many total hours was I expecting to collect? What was the minimum percentage of valid inflations across the monitoring period? And those have been traditional criteria for many years. Uh, more and more people are talking now about am I going to allow some hours of missing data? If my patient takes the cuff off for a couple of hours in the evening, is that going to be a problem? If I'm allowing some hours of missing, how many total? And am I allowing any consecutive hours? Because maybe you're really worried you, you can tolerate three hours of missing data, but you don't want them to be consecutive. And then Bob talked about minimum readings per hour. Am I going to require having one good reading every hour, or I consider my ABPM a failure? Some studies now, especially in early phase, are also synchronizing the timing of when you collect the ABPM. You might want to time it around when people are, are having breakfast. And so you may say, hey, my ABPMs need to start always by 8 a.m. and uh, I need to start between 8 a.m. and 10 a.m. So that's one of the criteria that you may want to be looking for. Also, some studies are looking at, I have different tolerance of criteria in screening than I do during treatment. And also consider if my criteria doesn't pass, if I don't get all the data I need, what am I going to do? How am I going to plan for that? Am I going to allow a, a repeated visit? And the more you repeat the visits, the harder the compliance is that we see. Traditionally, most studies will allow one repeat per failed visit. If you're going to allow that, you want to make sure that the site understands that and plan accordingly in terms of your timing. Let the person's arm rest between the sessions so that they may be more compliant during the repeat. Cuff sizing is really important and, and also cuff, cuff comfort. So the wrong size might mean the wrong data is being reported. So it's really important to measure for the right size and plan for the right size. So how do, you, how do you plan for that? Because there's different size cuffs, and if you're deploying to a lot of sites, you're ordering cuffs, how do you know how many standard cuff sizes you have? How many large, how many extra large do you need small? So we always suggest that you measure the patient's arm during the screening process as early as possible, because then you can see if this patient's going to get enrolled, these are the cuffs that I'm going to need, and I have plenty of time to order more if I don't have them. Some sponsors are asking us, can I associate BMI with predicting what cuff sizes I'm going to need? And we've even gotten the question of, is it validated, uh, are cuff sizes validated for BMI? They're specifically validated for upper arm size, but there's a lot of publications that link BMI to, to the upper arm, and we have those charts that are available so you can kind of at least predict within 75% of confidence that, you are, that, that if you're tracking BMI and your inclusion-exclusion criteria, you can predict which cuffs you're likely going to need to use for your populations. And again, 
we think it's important not to guess. Go ahead and include as one of your screening steps having your site measure the upper arm. So patient populations are a big consideration. We see a lot of diversity in compliance depending upon the population. If you know your patients, particularly with elderly, for instance, if you know your patients are sensitive or thin skin, they're probably going to experience more abrasions and more bruising. There are some strategies to help plan for that. Um, and, and remember, when you identify those patients, you're going to want to talk through those, those expectations. Um, we don't collect smoking in our database, but our hypertensive experts have told us that in their clinical practice, they find that smokers are less compliant. And so if you all are tracking that in your inclusion exclusion criteria, that might be something to be aware of, that your smokers may need to have more attention paid about their data quality. Um, are your patients going home with a cough? Uh, it's important to know if they're going home with a cough, they may need to um, put to adjust the cuff. And so you want to make sure that the cuffs that you're using in your trial are easy to self-administer. Also, be aware of what's going on at home. Do they have a caregiver? Do they have a family member that might help them place the cuff? And if not, you want to make sure that whoever might be applying the cuff um, gets to practice and gets to feel confident in how to do that uh, application properly. So the, one of the key um, points here is to provide enough time, right? Site personnel are super busy and they usually have a lot of tasks to do. It's important to, to plan to give them the time to meet with those, um, to, to spend time with the subjects and caregivers that they're engaged so that they understand and feel confident. A, a real difficult patient population that we see are obese patients. And some studies, because of the, the diabetes and, and obesity-related diseases and often linked to hypertension, we do see some studies intentionally including obese patient cohorts in their trials. And on those cohorts, we do know that those patients tend to be less compliant. And again, this makes it's practical sense, right? The patients have larger arms, larger cuffs. It takes longer to inflate and deflate. So typically, they're exposed to longer total inflation deflation times. Also, because of the obesity, sometimes the cuff has trouble detecting systolic, and so it'll, it'll inflate up to the max more often. And that causes more discomfort. And if the cuff is struggling to detect the blood pressure, it may retry more often. So ultimately, when you look at how the much data is coming in from the obese patients, you see more the, 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 the cuff struggling for the collecting the inflations, and you see more total inflations are required with, with failed and repeated inflations. And so they've got more exposure time. Also, because of the shape of the arm, the, the site coordinator may be aware about how they need to make sure they drape those cuffs appropriately to make sure that they stay comfortable. And one of the other things we hear complaints about, more with obese patients, but with the whole patient population, particularly during the summer, is sweating. You know, there's, they're sweaty, it's uncomfortable, um, but there are mechanisms to deal with that, like uh, cuff barriers. So it's important to be aware of that, and are you going to want those at your site to help that, that um, complaint to help resolve that complaint. So again, we're suggesting, you know, make sure you're allowing for extra time for site to spend with the patients to kind of think through what are the expectations, what are they likely to experience, and, and how can they stay engaged and, and improve their compliance. So you look for vendors that are going to help you with, with identifying these issues and resolving these issues, right? You want to work with people that have experience specific to ABPM. You want both clinical science operational support, right? You need project managers that really understand the nuances, what's going on with the data, when certain sites might be struggling, what to do. You want a help desk that really understands how to help those particular site calls. Logistics needs to be really tuned in to the, the, the equipment that's going out. So it's good to have teams that are experienced with that, not just late phase, which was the traditional, but also early phase, because those concerns of those nuances are really different. ABPM devices need to be easy to use. There are validation standards in the industry, and you should use devices that meet those standards, published standards. 
if you are doing a large global study, not every manufacturer uh, has certifications in every country, and some manufacturers are letting some of those certifications lapse, particularly like, for instance, China, Russia, countries that are a little bit harder to get equipment into. So you want to be aware of that up front to see, do, or do you have mechanisms to get devices into countries that might be problematic? Um, do you have the right range of cuff sizes? If you're doing an obese cohort, does the device, is it validated with cuff sizes that allow you to monitor those patients? And I urge you to avoid rechargeable batteries. It's common that some of these devices use rechargeable batteries. We see this big failure point, right? Forget to recharge batteries. And rechargeable batteries are finicky, and we, you'll have whole 24 hours that are lost because the batteries are not, are not, don't have appropriate um, charges. So we suggest you always use devices that are not using rechargeable batteries. Software. So your device always talks to software at the site. And these days, you have standards that you want to make sure you're comfortable, that an auditor or your data is, that auditor is going to be comfortable with the software and your data is going to be protected. It should meet today's search security standards. You shouldn't be collecting, you know, protected health information. And there should be workflows and controls specific to clinical trials. A lot of the software or third-party software are made for hospitals. You want to see, does the software understand what the workflow is like at the site for the clinical trial? So it should be able to be customized based on the demographic fields and formats. You should have a visit pull-down specific to your visit schedule. And you should have a variety of inflation plans and quality criteria that you can select based on the nuances of your trial. And you need immediate review of APM results at the site, right? You, you shouldn't have to wait for several days to get your results because it's important for the site personnel to know how did the patient do. Uh, particularly, it's really useful if they can actually talk to the patient right then, look at the data, um, to, to talk through any compliance issues right then. So how are they going to know they need to have that discussion? It needs to be obvious to them whether the ABPM passed or failed. And if it failed, it should be really clear as to what the problem was. Was it because there was gaps in data that likely mean the cup was taken off? Or does it look like there's a lot of single artifact inflations, which means the patient was moving? And the data needs to be easy to get to the back end um, so that ultimately you can centralize the data for, for everybody to have access to the reporting. <clears throat> but one of the other nuances we see is um, sponsors change their, change their mind about the inflation plans or their quality criteria in particular, particularly if their patient population is struggling. And so you may, <clears throat> you may need to push out an automated software update um, you don't want your site, they'll have to send their laptops back to a vendor to have them updated. You should have an automatic way to update the software in the field. So the, the, to conclude, the things that our experience has taught us that are really important for the site and the patients to be successful in collecting the data that you need and to not suffer traditional ABPM compliance issues is site instructions, training, and practice. Uh, we also think in our software, we think it's really important to collect which cuff was used and which arm the cuff was applied to and actually track that in the database because that's a great clue. If you're starting to see some real problems with compliance and the patient says they're doing what they need to do and the site says they're doing what they need to do, that's one of the first places we look to see is there some indication that the arm was switched or that the, wrong, that the cuff size has changed. Um, again, that immediate and easy to understand quality feedback is really critical for, uh, for site personnel to understand how to work with the patient. Um, and it's the relationship, right? It's the relationship between your site and that patient uh, so that the coaching is really successful. Uh, these are the things that we, particularly when we see the difference when novice sites versus the really experienced sites. The, the more experience your sites get and the more able they are to coach the patients, we know that that's going to be great ways for you guys to, to be able to get all the data that you need to have. And with that, I'm going to hand it back to Vidi. Thank you, Tricia, and thank you, Dr. Kleiman. So we have reached the presentation, the conclusion of the presentation part of today's webinar. We do have time for some Q&A.
There is a Q&A uh, box in your screen. If you open that up, you can input your questions. I will read them out and direct them to either Dr. Kleiman or to Tricia. So we do have some questions that have come in. So the first question um, is, I realize that this guidance is draft and suggests that chronic use drugs could increase BP should get a BPM. However, the draft is silent on drugs intended to lower BP. In this light, how is a BPM um, as an endpoint viewed by agency to treat BP? This is Dr. Kleiman. I'll take that one. Very interesting question. If you read the title of the guidance, it says presser effects. And the FDA has really focused late on drugs that increase blood pressure. But we know full well that there are other drugs that decrease blood pressure by many mechanisms. And I think the level of concern from the FDA is really going to depend, again, on magnitude of the effect the population that's being treated, the duration. The drugs that produce a small drop in blood pressure for prolonged periods of time in a hypertensive cardiovascular population might actually, that could be beneficial for all we know, as opposed to in a heart failure population with maximal medication for, for heart failure, they might have very little reserve left and even a small drop in blood pressure could make them symptomatic. Typically, again, for small blood pressure effects, not as great a concern unless you have a particularly vulnerable population. In contrast, if you have a large blood pressure reduction, that is a very different story and would be treated individually. So I think it, there's less concern about it unless you have a particularly vulnerable population or a very large effect. Okay, thank you, Dr. Pyman. So another one has come in. This might be a good question for Tricia. Do you have any recommendations for ABPM devices? There seems to be a wide range in quality and price. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, you know, they do vary. In general, when you look at the devices that we, and we test, we have a couple in our inventory and we're actually evaluating three other devices now um, because we don't feel like there's the perfect device out there for clinical trials, and you need to have um, a diversity in what's available to, to pick the right device for the right uh, to resolve the right problem. Um, so, in general, the behaviors of the devices are really similar, and the, the the feel, the weight, how you wear them are all very similar. And in general, the software is pretty similar. The software from the third-party manufacturers is. I don't think it's uh, good. It's it's useful for clinical trials. It, it's um, it, it it's used for a different kind of use case, and so it is valuable to understand um, not just which devices and cuff availability make the most sense, but also what kind of software can you use to interact with the device. So there are there are published uh, websites that you can look up which devices are rated and how are they rated, and are there certain um, patient population nuances that you want to be aware of, and we're happy to share those. Um, there are a handful of devices that are traditionally used in clinical trials. So there is Space Labs has been a device that's been kind of the gold standard for many years. Uh, the Welsh Allen um, device is uh, is been used in some clinical trials. Uh, Mortara's uh, AMBU 2400 was uh, available in clinical trials, and that's be actually being discontinued. Um, so that device is no longer available. But there's also the Oscar II. The Suntech Oscar II is a really popular device. And Microlife has a series of ABPM devices that are good. And along with also IEM, this is a German company. They specialize in pulse wave analysis. Uh, and so they also have good devices. So there is a good range of four or five manufacturers, I'd say, that have a, a good range of uh, global coverage and good standard validated devices to use. But I do think you also want to look at whatever vendor you're selecting to help you implement a BPM. Have there been some ways that they're able to utilize the software that's going to be a little bit more aligned with clinical trials and hospital use? Thank you, Tricia. 
So we have a whole bunch more questions. If we can't get to all the questions in a lot of time today, we will be emailing the, uh, the individuals who posted these questions. So here's another question. Um, maybe this is for Dr. Kleinman. Does this apply to device studies as well? The guidance that really comes from CEDAR, from the drug side of the FDA, and we haven't had much comment and we haven't had many requests for blood pressure data on devices. If you had a device that was specifically likely to affect blood pressure, then I think the answer is yes, you would need intense ambulatory blood pressure monitoring to demonstrate the magnitude of the effect. But in general, probably not. Okay, thank you, Dr. Kleinman. Um, so in, in the same vein, there's another question. Um, is this guidance also applicable for biologics? For example, treating serious inflammatory diseases? And yes, the the answer is, pre, I think, pretty clear on that. This is for new drugs, including biologics. The Unlike QT interval, there are so many mechanisms by which a drug could have an effect on blood pressure that biologics potentially may as well. Okay. Uh, so, Tricia, here's one for you. Based on your experience, what upper limit of arm circumference uh, for cuff size, what's the upper limit of the arm circumference? Uh, I believe 55. I'll double check against the, the uh, cuffs that we have. Um, but we do have a chart that we can share that actually kind of lays out the different BMI ranges and which cuff sizes, because the cuffs do kind of overlap one another. So we also include then which BMI ranges there are and then which cuffs that you can select might be appropriate to cover that particular BMI range. But again, it's important to understand that when you read through these charts and you read the publications, they do warn that every patient is a little different and every you know, patient um, body shapes are a little different. And so they find that BMI is reliable for about 75% of those that you're using that as a reference. So you're probably going to have a quarter of those patients. Well, you know, you're still going to need to, we still suggest that you measure the arm to make sure that's going to work. Okay. I think this might be one for Dr. Kleiman. In your experience, has 50% validity criteria been acceptable to the FDA? I was afraid someone would answer that because the answer is we don't really know. Several members of the IRT, the members of the cardiovascular division who actually participated in the review of QT data, several of those members participated and presented their modeled data. The problem with this is the fact that someone from the FDA presents some data and gives their opinion does not bind the rest of the FDA. It doesn't bind cardiorenal, and it definitely doesn't bind the other review divisions. So I think it's going to be unclear until either people present protocols to the FDA that suggest the use of 50% valid data as the threshold for acceptability, and until we actually have some protocols that have been completed, used this criterion, have been reviewed by the FDA. So for the moment, I think it's reasonable, but yes, there is certainly no firm assurance that all of the different review divisions will accept this. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kleinman. Here's another one that might be appropriate for, for you. Do you think that do you think that we will be able to use concentration BP effect modeling as we're starting to do for QTC assessments? I, I think the answer is going to be yes, because the Cardiorenal division, at least, is very interested in concentration effect modeling. The limitations of this, though, are, are fairly evident. First, you have to make sure that you're measuring blood pressure and plasma concentration at steady state. And that might be four to six weeks after starting a drug. It's difficult to get really intense PK throughout the day on a patient who's been started on the drug and has been taking it for six to 
let's say six, eight, 12 weeks. It's just difficult to re recruit patients for that. I think what that means is this concentration BP effect monitoring is really going to be used for phase one studies, whether they're in patients or in healthy volunteers, where typically in the SAD and MAD studies, you have the patients in a unit for at least six to eight hours, if not for the full 24 hours. The problem there, of course, is going to be in a healthy volunteer study, you may have them for long enough to be able to get steady state assessments. You know, in a MAD study, you may keep the, the subjects in house for 10 or 14 days, and that may be long enough. The problem, though, with healthy volunteer studies is the guidance says this should be done in the patient population. When we talk about patient studies that are SAD MAD studies, we're usually talking about oncology and sometimes diabetes or other diseases where healthy volunteers aren't appropriate. And the problem there is when we're dealing with patients, we do not like to confine them to a unit for 10 to 14 days. We, if anything, have them briefly early on in, in the trial. So it, I think we're all very interested in it because it could be a very helpful technique, but there's some very practical limitations that I think get in the way and really have to be thought about and developed. Okay, thank you, Dr. Kleiman. We've reached the conclusion of our webinar today. Um, I've received many questions asking if the slides or the recording will be sent out. The recording will be emailed to everyone who attended today's call. Um, and questions we were not able to answer in the allotted time, we will be reaching out to you via email to answer your questions. Again, feel free to reach out to our experts today, to uh, Dr. Kleiman and Tricia. And um, thank you again for joining our call today.